Well, um, I think we're starting. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we're all a bit rusty here uh, because we haven't done one of these in a, in a couple of months. But thank you so much um, for everyone coming here uh, and online as well this evening. Um, I'm Andrew Butler. I work here at Tortoise. Um, and if you haven't been to a thinking before, um, it's meant to replicate a, a feeling of a, of a newsroom environment. Um, so everyone getting involved, everyone informing uh, where we should take our journalism, hearing different people's thoughts from uh, a, a wide range um, in this particular field. Um, there will be certain topics that we'll be dis discussing this evening that, um, that we're all aware. Football runs along tribal lines from time to time. So some controversial things will probably get said um, uh, over the course of this evening, but um, this is a space for, for civilized disagreement. Um, so if you have anything to say, do raise your hand and uh, we'll get your microphone over to you or um, raise your hand digitally and, uh, and we'll try and come to you on the screens as well. Um, if I can start by uh, welcoming our guests here um, and our contributors, um, because we're joined by an absolute stellar panel um, for our first thinking back in the tortoise newsroom. Um, Kieran Maguire will be on the screens. He's a football finance lecturer at the University of Liverpool. Um, Anthony Burnett, um, the CEO of Football's Equality and Inclusion Organization, kick it out here. Uh, Flo Lloyd-Hughes at the end, uh, a broadcaster and journalist working with The Athletic, BBC, The Ringer, amongst many, many others. Um, David Harrison, a journalist who was an integral part of the Al Jazeera investiga uh, investigative unit. Um, who last year released a documentary, um, an, an incredible bit, bit of work in a podcast series called uh, The Men Who Sell Football. Um, and it was an extraordinary expose of the, the murky world of club ownership in, in England. Um, uh, Chris Paris, uh, a board member of the Football Supporters Association and co-chair of Proud Lily Whites. Um, and uh, I'm hoping maybe on the screen we can flash up Dale Vince, who um, is the chair and owner of League Two Club uh, Forest Green Rovers, who um, I, I will come to Dale shortly, but I believe he's dialed in from Port Vale, which um, if anyone in this room has also done Port Vale away on a Tuesday night, <laughs> Fair play to you, um, because, because it's, it's not far from Stoke. It's a hell of a journey, and at this time of year, um, you know, a, a tricky one, and I can speak from personal experience on that regard as well. Um, let's get going. Um, football has probably never been better. Uh, the scale it enjoys, the quality of people um, or, and players on the pitch, the way it's cemented itself as a truly global game, bringing joy, excitement, and... Let's be honest, over the past year and a half, two years during the pandemic, a bit of purpose actually to a lot of people's lives, hundreds of millions of people around the world. But in recent years, the sheer volumes of money and where that comes from means it's hard for some to, to reconcile um, their enjoyment of the game to the fact that that money propping up parts of the game can come from um, ugly let's say, and unethical sources. Um, so what can fans realistically do is a question that we want to, to answer today, um, given that you know, everyone wants a piece of the pie um, in an industry which is still growing after 160 years after it was first codified. Um, so I've, over the course of the next hour, I hope we can kind of wrestle with some of these issues um, and get to, to a better idea of, 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 of where the industry is going, what fans might be able to do, and, uh, and also look at where potentially for us as tortoise we can go with some stories uh, for um, our journalism. Um, I want to start um, with Kieran and Maguire because um, I probably unfairly described him as just merely a, a university lecturer of uh, football, football finance, but um, Kieran is the, the, the doyen, I would say, of football finance um, in, in this country. Um, he's written an amazing book and has an incredible podcast called the, the, the Price of Football, which is essentially a textbook. I didn't think I'd reach the age of 32 um, wanting to read textbooks on, on stuff, but it basically goes into so much depth and detail about, um, about football finance. Um, Kieran, I wanted to start in the broadest sense possible. Where do you think football is uh, in terms of its health financially, and is it in a good place? Um, football is, uh, is reliant upon owners, is reliant upon sponsors. Uh, it is living beyond its means uh, as far as the vast majority of clubs are concerned. Um, the, the solution to all of football's problems, if we read the conventional newspapers, if we listen to the phone-ins and, and if you follow 
uh, follow trends on social media and uh, and fan forums is spending somebody else's money and uh, that that narrative is constantly delivered um, and, and it becomes part of the psyche of the game so um, what we have in football is that the two clubs who historically have lost the most money in the history of the Premier League are Chelsea and Manchester City. Chelsea are presently the uh, uh, UEFA Champions League uh, holders and Manchester City are the Premier League uh, winners and they are presently winning. They're, they're presently at the top of the Premier League. So there's an inverse relationship with uh, uh, financial success and on the field success. At the other of the scale, the, the two clubs who have made the most profit in the history of the Premier League are Tottenham Hotspur and Arsenal. And I don't know whether there's any Tottenham or Hotspur or Arsenal fans in, in the room, but if you ask them to say whether they're happy uh, with, with their present uh, position in, in the football stratosphere, I suspect it will be negative. And yet, from my point of view as, as a pure financial analyst, they're very good. But from a football <coughs> fan's perspective, they're at the opposite end of the scale. And it's, and it's those two clashes of culture that are, are, are generate so much of the problems in the game today. Okay, thank you so much um, for giving that, um, that background um, uh, to this discussion, um, Kieran. We'll come back to you too shortly. Um, David, I want to go to you about um, the susceptibility of football club owners. Um, just give us a background on, on your work and um, if you possibly can in about 15 to 20 seconds, describe, <laughs> you know, uh, describe your hour-long documentary uh, in, in that time. Okay, um, so essentially we set out to, to, to ask the question to test whether it was possible for a criminal to buy an English football club. So we set up an undercover team and we posed as the representatives of hugely wealthy Chinese buyers who wanted to move into English football. We made it clear that they were, uh, the, the main investor had a criminal conviction, seven years for bribery and money laundering, uh, that he was sentenced in absentia, got his money out of uh, uh, China through Macau, casinos, and clearly laundering his money, and now wants to find a nice, clean home for it. And uh, we, we, we met uh, this, this uh, uh, he's an offshore finance expert and a football deal maker and a former director of a, of a number of clubs. Anyway, he showed us, first of all, how it was possible to hide money and hide identity. Of people who got lots of money hide their identity and hide their money offshore. That was stage one. Second one was he showed us how to hide the name of the, the, the would-be owners from everybody except the Football League. We pushed further and said, well, how about even from the Football League? He said, I know. We can get you get him another passport. That led us to Cyprus, where we uncovered a huge financial a passport scam, more than a scam, huge corruption where people right up to the level of the president of the parliament, no less, was involved in selling passports to anybody, including a number of criminals, and he was prepared, they were all prepared to, to help our guy get a passport, and the, 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 the offshore finance guy would deal with all the finance, and so bingo, we, we established, he even took us up, this guy wasn't just a, a it wasn't all just braggadocio, this guy took us up to Derby County, he picked up the phone to Mel Morris in, in our presence, the owner of Derby County, and within days we were up there, sitting in front of Mel Morris, negotiating a deal to buy one of England's oldest football clubs, 99 million. Um, and obviously we pulled out because we didn't want to get in the way of, of genuine buyers, as it were. But we'd, we'd established that it was absolutely possible for a criminal to buy a football club. Is that enough, Stephanie? That's, I mean, it's an excellent description of the documentary. Uh, going back to the point on, on susceptibility, what is it about football clubs? What is it about the, the industry of football that is so, I, I, yeah. perhaps attractive yeah. to this type of investor or, um, or, or, or is it, are they using it essentially for nefarious means? Well, they can do all those things possible. I mean, football is attractive, why? Because it's popular globally. There are enormous amounts of money, it was particularly with the advent of satellite television, so the sale of television rights brings huge uh, uh, amounts of money into clubs. Um, so it's attractive. Um, it's in the, there's, there's, there's a lot of money, and if you get, you know, it, there aren't that many people who've got the sort of squillions needed to buy football clubs. You have to remember this. And you know, there is an old adage that uh, show me a rich man, I'll show you a crook. That's not always true, but I expect it is. Well, I know it's true in a number, of, a lot of cases, shall we say. So the question then is one of governance. How do you test these people who want to buy our football clubs? And you have a due diligence process, you examine them, and that's weak. That's where we fall down. The EFL. 
we had the, their, their reaction, their response to, to our stuff was, 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 was pathetic. It was cowardly. They were running away. They didn't want to know. They wanted to bury their heads in the sand. The EPL Saudi Arabia, you know, we'd only just read about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the journalist Khashoggi being sort of kidnapped, chopped up and burnt in acid. But that was okay for them to buy uh, Newcastle. And so you have got, you've got a susceptibility partly because they want to deliver for the fans. And, you know, as, as we said, football is incredibly tribal. And that can be a good thing and a bad thing. It c the tribal also means, it means that they're rooted in their communities. They're very attached to their club. It's an emotional bond. You know, I mean, I grew up within walking distance of Anfield, you know, and that club, the first time I heard you never walk out, it's in, it is, it really is in there somewhere. You, you, there's no escaping that emotional bond that, that you have with, uh, with football clubs. And of course, the thing it does, ownership conveys a certain social cachet. You know, you're, you're the owner of a major football club. So if you've got dodgy money, you can A, wash it, and then B, wash your reputation. So it's it's win-win in terms of those, those possibilities. And the susceptibility boils down to the fact that they've got huge amounts of money, ostensibly, and it's almost, almost in the interest of the governing bodies not to ask too many questions, but certainly in their financial interest, whether it's in their ethical or moral interest is a totally different question. Chris, I want to come to you about, um, uh, about what fans realistically can do, because we can hear all this, we can hear um, how, you know, how owners can come into clubs. There is a certain powerlessness from a fan's perspective, because you're not in the question at all. David proved you can go to a club and you can buy as long as you have enough money. You don't even need to prove that you have the money at, at that particular time. But you, from your perspective, you're um, a member of the, the Football Supporters Association on the board there. When you see football clubs changing hands, when you see the Saudi takeover of, uh, of Newcastle, and OK, we'll, we'll come on to the, the Saudi takeover of Newcastle and, and um, I suppose the, the positive feeling there was amongst a, 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 a huge amount of fans there. Where is there um, a, a place for, for fans to, to make their voice heard when they go, do you know what, this isn't for me, yet yeah, I've been a fan of this club for decades? There's a lot in that. <laughs> yeah. um, well, look, I think from, a, from an FSA perspective, which is the Football Supporters Association, we did a lot of work on, on the fan-led review that Tracy Crouch um, just led. And actually, if you look at this kind of, I don't know, 93 recommendations or something, it's a long old document, and one of them is that actually you need a proper regulator and an independent regulator that's actually gonna, that's actually gonna, that's gonna have some teeth. It's gonna be a separate organization that does all of those things. You know, and that's really important for all the reasons that, that David's just set out. I mean, you know, as, as I understand it, and David, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, they don't, it, you know, like how you do like a KYC process for a bank, like the know your customer, and also what you have to provide to like open a mobile phone um, account. They don't do the same thing to buy a football club. They don't, I'm sorry, if I may, if you don't leave the inquiry too much about where the money's come from. Yeah. And the key, as our man pointed out, if you get it into the into an escrow account, a sort of holding account, with an English law firm, because they're so pucker and proper and would never deal with criminals, then you're fine. There'll be no questions asked. But imagine, though, that it takes more to open, to get a new mobile phone deal, than it does to buy a football club. That's just a thing to think about there for a second. So if you've got a proper regulator in place, actually that's going to make a difference. So, and the Football Supporters Association has got, you know, tens of thousands of members up and down the country from the Premier League to the national game that are all working together on this stuff. And I think it was, it was, I think it was probably a surprise to um, Tracy and her panel was actually how much knowledge there was amongst the fans who gave evidence because I mean you know like hundreds of fans gave evidence over over that period and not and not you know you're expecting passion but it's just like the knowledge of how this stuff works and why it matters and I think the thing is you could argue and you hear this all the time it's like well you know global capitalism has thrown us into the mire and any brand that you engage with any company you engage with is basically going to have something dirty in it somewhere but the thing that we all will always say is that football clubs are community assets. David said it there earlier, you know, Liverpool's in his heart. 
Um, and that's the thing for all of us. It's like, you know, those clubs are there before us. They're going to be there after us. They're going to be there regardless of who the owners are, who the players are, who the manager is, etc. But the fans will always be there. And that's why we have to protect those community assets. So as, as fans, you, you know, you organise around that stuff. And if we come on to... Um, come on to Saudi Arabia, it's one of the things as, you know, the Prime Leader Whites, um, um, David mentioned those, uh, sorry, um, Andrew mentioned them earlier, is the official Tottenham Hotspur LGBTQ plus supporters association. Very niche, very important to me. Um, and actually one of the things that we felt really strongly when, um, when the uh, PIF bought um, Newcastle, because it matters to us that you don't have regimes that persecute people, regimes that put people, chop them up and put them in duffel bags, owning our football clubs, if they are important community assets. And so, but we thought, well, how can we as fans do something about that? And, you know, like taking on the big stuff, because you end up with, you know, we, we see this all the time, so much whataboutery, right? And I understand that. There's, and there are lots of things you could point to However, we're talking about this thing here. And so the thing that we did is we focused on, and Adam Crafton at The Athletic did an incredible piece, which I recommend that everybody would read, where he spoke to um, 20 to 30 um, LGBTQ plus um, Saudis and talked to them about their lives. And the thing that really stuck out in my mind was where they said, it's really difficult for us because obviously the Premier League, global product, um, it's really... You know, seeing on the TV lots of people jumping up and down at the prospect of our government owning this football club, um, wearing kind of, you know, tea towels on their heads or whatever it was they were doing, and celebrating it when our lives are in danger every single day. And there's a guy called Suhail Al-Jamil. Um, I am answering the question. <laughs> um, there's a guy called Suhail Al-Jamil who is reportedly in prison. Um, he suffered 100 lashes. Um, for mimicking a woman, I put that in inverted commas, and he's basically their most um, uh, sort of high-profile um, LGBTQ plus activist. And, you know, for them, what they said to Adam was, you know, understanding what's happened to Suhail is really important to us because he's a real beacon for LGBTQ plus Saudis. So we thought, as fans, the thing that we can do is at least highlight what's happened to Sahil. So actually Spurs were the first team to play Newcastle at St. James's um, after the takeover. And so we had like, I think two or three of our members who were up there who did made like a little free Sahil video, hashtag free Sahil. Um, I think it was viewed like 100,000 times. Um, it got so, like, you know, got some traction and other LGBTQ plus fan groups have followed in that. So, you know, I think there are small actions you can make, which as a fan matters. Um, and then also there's like the bigger stuff that we're talking about, like being, being part of the FSA, for example, and, you know, being able to contribute to something like the fan led review and ending up with recommendations that say we need better governance in football. Yeah, thank you. I'm Going back to the issue of, uh, of ownership, I wonder if I can speak to, uh, to Dale Vince, um, who I mentioned was, uh, uh, I believe, hi Dale, are, are you at Port Vale? I, I am at Port Vale, I'm in the chairman's office, it's very nice of her actually to let me borrow this for, for this. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's incredibly kind of them, I know that Port Vale's owners um, are, are incredibly kind people as well themselves, um, so I feel a bit bad about, um, about m m making jibes at them uh, earlier in the evening. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Dale, Forest Green Rovers are, um, are doing remarkably well this season. Um, if you would just indulge me for, for one second, um, the team that I support are also in League Two. Um, you drew one all of us earlier this season, but they're doing amazingly well. But you as an owner, um, and for those who are unaware of, of, of Dale Vincent and um, kind of what he stands for, Forest Green are um, the world's first vegan football club. Um, he's been uh, owner there for 12 years, um, I, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, Dale. But you see this stuff, you, you are still in this field of, of being a club owner. You must see who owns clubs in, in the Premier League and you yourself own a club um, that's been promoted from the National League up to League Two. Um, look very good for, for getting promoted up to League One as well this season. What is it in it for you 
as an owner? Why do you want to own a football club? And, um, and what's the aim? What's the end goal for you? Cool, right. <clears throat> so um, first off, I don't see myself as an owner. I see myself more as a kind of custodian. <clears throat> I didn't buy the club. I uh, rescued it and took responsibility for it. I did it just because it was a big part of the local community. It was on the verge of bankruptcy and relegation in 2010, so that's 11 years ago. Um, and and I, I didn't do it with any great deal of uh, preparation or pre-thought. Hmm. I just thought it's my local football club. It was 120 years old at the time, big part of this local community. I am a football <laughs> fan, but also I live and work in the area. It was my backyard, and it didn't seem to need a lot of help or money, so I just got involved and within a couple of months. The uh, people running the club were saying to me, you need to be the chairman, uh, otherwise the club's going to fold, which, by which they really meant I needed to um, you know, pick up its debts and stuff like that. And, uh, and so I just faced a very simple choice, watch the club fold or take responsibility for it. I chose to do that without uh, thinking about what it might involve. Day one, I found that we were serving red meat, and I stopped that because it's against my principles. Quickly found that there are a whole bunch of things being done at the club it didn't sit with me, um, not just environment things, but ethical things as well. There was a lot of stuff I didn't like, and so I just started to change it all and realized within a few weeks, actually, it was a kind of post-event rationalization that actually all of the changes together would be so comprehensive that we would be creating a different kind of football club, a green football club, and we'd be reaching out to a very different kind of audience to the one we were used to working with. With our environment message, uh, I run an energy company called Eco City, world's first green energy company, founded in 1995. And um, that made it more appealing that we wouldn't be preaching to the choir because it was a bigger challenge and the biggest challenges are the most worthwhile things to do. And so we just uh, got on with it and uh, transformed the club. We became the first club to be carbon neutral under UN auspices a few years ago. Uh, the UN kicked off a global scheme called Sport for Climate Action, uh, which is very much aligned to what we've done at Forest Green Rovers. I've become a, um, what do they call that, a, a champion, climate champion for that program with the UN. All of this is beyond my wildest dreams. Our platform uh, through football has, has been incredible. The reach that we've had, we reach uh, you know, millions of people around the world. We've got fan clubs in 20 different countries. Our fans have gone vegetarian and vegan, and that's probably the most important thing for me. We've actually reached our fans. Our fans don't just tolerate what we do, they embrace it. And you know, joyfully, at the same time, we've achieved success on the pitch because we go about things in, in the right way. This is my, my view. You know, we, we try to make steady progress every year. We t treat people properly. We do things decently. And uh, we make step-by-step -step improvements. And this year, we're having a great year. So uh, the reason I mention that is because it's super important. When you set out to do something green or alternative, this is my experience for 20 odd years of doing this, it's no good being OK at it. Uh, so, you know, we built a car in uh, 2008, first electric car, super electric car in, in, in Britain. It was never going to be good enough for it to be okay. It had to be a supercar. Uh, we have an organic pitch. It's never enough for it to be okay. It has to be a great pitch. It won the award in League Two last season. Same with our food. It's, you know, it's vegan food. It has to be great food. Otherwise, you know, people judge you. So here we are as a football club, sat at the top of the league and promoting a green agenda. And the two things enhance each other. You can't have one without the other. So we're in a great place at the moment. But I'm not an owner. I'm a custodian. As, uh, as the last person said, the, uh, the club existed before me. It will exist after me. <clears throat> and, and in this period of time, I'm guiding the club to a place it's never been before and trying to do some real good in the world with it. Your success, um, you know, considering um, how successful you've been in the last few years, but especially um, uh, this season, um, as you go up the leagues, there is an expectation to increase your finances. You have to, you have to pay players, the wages increase. Um, of course, your, um, your turnover will, will, will also increase as well. Where does that conflict, or where can you envisage that conflict coming in terms of expectations that, well, you've led them to this level, your fans will start to expect more, um, you yourself might expect more from, from being on the pitch. Are you gonna have, or can you foresee a time where you go, well, we might need a bit more investment or, um, or, or, or uh, uh, you know, other people might want to come and invest in your club and you say, do you know what, I've, I've taken this as far as I can, I will sell up. Well, 
there's a lot there. So we had a bigger budget in the National League, actually, than we have today in League Two. Our budget is eighth in the league and we sit top of the league. So I think what we've learned in the last few years is how to spend money more effectively as a football club. And absolutely, in, in the early days, the temptation was just to throw money at it. You know, I joined the club in 2010. We had 13 full-time players. Um, that was it. Never trained on a full-size pitch. And <clears throat> and our budget was tiny, like I think a couple of hundred thousand pounds. It was easy to say, well, look, let's just lob a couple of hundred thousand pounds on the budget, let's double it, and, um, and see what happens. But that isn't the way to get success in football, in my view and in my experience. So, you know, here we are, uh, eighth biggest uh, budget in the league, sitting top of the league. We, we're obviously looking at League One now. Uh, we've been looking for a while. You know, we, we, we see the future. We plan it. We, w we intend to be in the championship. Uh, that's, um, that's absolutely been our goal for a number of years. We're not in a hurry. We intend to enjoy the journey. That's much more important than the destination. But we can see League One coming. And we won't have to uh, do anything else than spend our extra revenue on our budget, in our view, to uh, do well in League One. And now we're a club that trades in the black. We've done that for a few years now. Um, we've, we've quadrupled sponsorship in the last three years. We've doubled it in the pandemic. And we are probably blessed in that respect because of what we stand for um, and because we stand almost alone and unique in the world of football as a green football club. And as the world changes and businesses increasingly are introducing green products and things, they're looking for places to sponsor that come into Forest Green Rovers. So we're, we're pretty fortunate in that respect. Sponsorship has become a big deal to us or, or bigger deal to us. Uh, but you know, we, we seek sustainability in um, all definitions of the word. That's beyond just environment sustainability, it's financial sustainability, and it's also about people as well. You know, the most important thing are the people around you and how you treat them, in my view. Do you think, um, uh, and uh, going back to Dale, but uh, Flo, I'll, I'll come to you on this as well um, shortly um, with, with the same question that, um, the, Dale, do you think that sometimes fans also have to take responsibility for what their expectations will be. Forest Green Rovers fans, you could argue, have, have never had it so good because they've been in, uh, they're, um, they're in League Two, they're looking good for League One, but their expectations grow in, uh, you know, and it correlates with, with the success of the club. Do you think that fans sometimes don't help themselves in putting pressure on owners to, to spend more, to, to get better players in? Um, we've just had transfer deadline day has been uh, been and gone and you know Thousands and millions of fans around the country will go Our owners have let us down again because they didn't get such and such a player and uh, And now we're we're destined for mediocrity once again this season Yeah, look, there's no doubt that, uh, Fan impatience fan expectations um, You know they can be an issue if, if you let them bother you. I was just having a chat to the people here um, before this about uh, what fans think. I mean, we went up uh, and took a look at the stadium from the top of the ground. I think it looks amazing. I think what they've done here is fantastic. And the point made back to me was, you know, try telling our fans that because, you know, they're complaining about, uh, I don't know what it was, you know, the toilets aren't, aren't working very well or something like that. And, and you know, we've been a, through a process ourselves as a football club in which we've seen the concerns of fans narrow down to things that you might consider to be quite trivial and operational and, and quite fixable. And we shrug and we say to ourselves, is that all they've got now? And that's a good thing. We're in a good place. Uh, but that's a different thing. You know, in terms of expectations on the pitch and expectations of spending big money, and look, I think some, some owners bring it on themselves. You know, the Saudi owners of Newcastle, they are going to be expected to spend big, absolutely. Um, and you'll get that. Doesn't have to be that way. Fans don't have to be that way. We all want our clubs to succeed, all fans. But you know how we succeed is more important than succeeding itself, in my view. Thanks very much, Dale. Um, Flo, I want to come to you as a um, as a QPR fan. Um, I know you do excellent work as a broadcaster and journalist, um, but um, QPR a few years ago had uh, had an interesting time of it. Let's say in terms of um, expectations spending beyond their means and um, and then the subsequent fallout from that. During that period of time, do you think that you had this these owners who came and lavishly spent, 
were you enjoying it at the time? Were you happy with it? Or were you thinking, hang on, alarm bells ring here. This can't be sustainable for, for our club. Well, it's funny listening to what Dale just said, because actually one of the things that always comes up at the QPR fans forum is the water pressure in the men's toilets in <laughs> one of the stands. So I know it is high on a lot of fans' agenda, that. Um, it, it was definitely, I think, um, worrying for a lot of fans. And I have always come from a place that I would rather be enjoying watching football than be part of the monster that is the Premier League. And for me, I want to see, you know, your team win, I think, is a priority. Not necessarily winning trophies, but winning games. And also be entertained, you know, see positive things on and off the pitch. So even though they were in the Premier League and that was, you know, s is successful in some ways, watching your team lose every week is quite miserable. Um, and then watch them pile on debt and lose every week is even more miserable. Um, so I think there's a, I think a lot of fans are having that real reality check now is, the, the Premier League is this, you know, it's a rat race to get there, but at what cost? And we're obviously seeing now how Derby County is still willing to find out who is going to become hopefully their new owner um, and are be being dealt with by administrators because they tried to chase that uh, and, and failed. And, and QPR have, have got a, a big fine because of trying to chase that. And I, I mean, I was saying to Tony and Chris earlier, just before we came on here about what I think QPR have done really recently and a number of things, they're very good in the community, but in terms of a fan relationship point of view, they've been very good over the last few years of being very open and communicating with fans and saying, we are broke. We don't have any money because someone spent it all and wasted it and now we've got loads of debt. And I think too many, too many clubs don't do that because there's obviously, a, a, you know, not just a sort of personal sort of ego thing of you want to you have ambition and fans don't like unambitious owners that's you know that's boring that's terrible you don't want your club to be the one that hasn't got any big ideas and isn't bringing bringing big signings um but i also think there's just the fact that they you know they actually genuinely believe they can do it and they think you know just one more throw of the dice will gamble it all bournemouth a team who are, are sort of in promotion contention out of the championship with qpr they signed five players yesterday on deadline day they are risking it all to go up they're being supported by parachute payments to the Premier League at the moment. But if it doesn't happen, they're going to be in a lot of financial difficulty as a result. So I, I feel comfortable that QPR are in a place right now that they've managed to become, you know, not sustainable, but better than they were. But if they were to get promoted, who knows whether they could retain that because they would probably want to chase the dream again. And I think there's, there's a panic that sets in as well that if it doesn't work out, you know, how can we rescue this thing? And I think I do sort of have to tip my hat to, to clubs like Burnley in some way, although, you know, they've had their difficulties with how their takeover went through recently. But the previous ownership have been one that's always kind of just banked and settled and cashed in and stayed afloat. Um, and I think when you can do that and still keep your fans happy, that's almost like a happy medium. That's really interesting. Has, has um, the QPR essentially coming out and saying we're broke, has that had any sort of galvanizing effect amongst the fan base? Because you're doing well again. I don't know what the, the, the state of the finances are and the, and your, the signings and, and the strategy behind that. But the feeling that a club from people that I know who support QPR is, is you know, the good times might be might be coming back and we're doing it in an entirely different way from when we were paying players like Christopher Zamba 100 grand a week. Yeah, I think it takes it takes a lot to get to that point, because before we were here, there was some pretty miserable times when the club was still broke and playing really badly and fans weren't happy and attendances were really poor. I think they've lucked out that they've managed to pick up some bargain players, found a good coach who's getting the best out of those players and being successful. And that's definitely galvanized, galvanized the fan base in a very positive way. But there are lots of other teams who haven't been as lucky, who are just as broke, but haven't managed to kind of, you know, find that magic ingredient that brings it all together. It is exceptionally difficult. And I, I think people, I think the, the issue with having something like the Premier League existing in the first place is that people will be forever chasing it and you know what are we now 30 years for on from its inception or even longer than that actually yeah um yeah so 30 30 years from its ex except, um, inception who knew that th that was going to be the start of you know everything that's been and gone the the, the chaos that's almost been left 
in its wake is, I think, concerning for a lot of fans who actually just want to go and watch their football and hang out with their friends and, you know, see people and and have a beer or have a pie and, you know, get that, that taste of a Saturday afternoon. They don't care about a lot of those other things. Yeah. But there's, there, there's something else that's more important. Um, Tony, um, I, I'm, I've been darting around from, from, from place to place, but, um, and, and, and you've been sat right there uh, very patiently. I wanted to ask on, on the fans issue. Um, as CEO of Kick It Out, you're incredibly experienced at mobilising and uh, uh, fans and um, and talking to policymakers um, uh, about uh, on an ever increasing spectrum. Um, what's your take on 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 kind of what fans are able to do? from uh, petitioning from clubs? What would your advice be to them? Um, and, and also your take on how the Premier League kind of trickles down. If, if, if there is trickle down economics in play at all mm. in football, because your organisation covers everything um, to do with football, what do you see and what's your experience of, uh, of the Premier League and its impact on, on the rest of the league? Again, it's a, that's a, quite a big question. <laughs> I'm trying to fit so yeah, much in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We have yeah. three hours today. Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, I'm a, I'm a Baltimore Ambers fan, I have to admit. And, um, and I'll, I'll just be absolutely honest, I think we've got probably with the most stupid fan base on the planet. <laughs> this and, is recorded. Uh, and it's absolutely fine. So an apologies to the vast majority of Bolton fans who aren't stupid, but I remember being a season ticket order when Big Sam was in charge. And watching us finish sixth, seventh, and eighth, and, and qualify for Europe two years on the trot, and listening to a group of Bolton fans booing the Bolton team when we had JJ Kocha, Yuri Jokaev, Nicholas Nelker up front, because there was a group of fans who'd grown up with us, nothing other than Premier League, and there was quite a lot of us who'd been around when we were finishing bottom of Division Three, the old Division Three, etc., etc. So, I think fan expectations can often create pressure, and, and I, th I equate that from a Bolton perspective to what we had ten years, fifteen years later, which is almost going out of business because fan expectations have become ridiculous when it comes to what Bolton were, were expecting. I remember saying to my 13-year-old son, listen to this and absorb it, son, because these fans are delirious. What you've just seen, Bolton playing in Europe for two years on the trot, you'll never see that again in your lifetime. He was 13 at the time, by the way, so, and I still don't think you'll ever see it in his lifetime. <laughs> Um, but it, but in, t in terms of the, the, the f I mean, we've got a, an organisation that uh, we run with the Football Supporters Association called Fans for Diversity, and, and just one group in particular, one group of, of supporters, we've now got over 60 LGBTQ plus fan groups across the country, and I think that's massively important for a number of reasons, you know, I think values are as important as financial responsibility when it comes to ownership of football clubs, and I think the way we instil values in football is by having fans voices from different backgrounds that are heard and are listened to. And the more we can have that, whether it's LGBTQ plus fans groups, we've got uh, Asian fans groups across the country now, Punjabi Rams are massively um, uh, present in, in the current conversations around Derby County. I think that's hugely important. Actually, it's hugely important in terms of the future of the game, because the future of the game is the game belongs to everybody. But I also think it's, it's massively important in, in uh, holding owners to account for the right things. And the Newcastle takeover was, it was a fantastic example of particularly LGBTQ plus fan groups coming together and saying we've got a problem with this and actually our voices are going to be heard and that's exactly where that voice should be coming from. Well, because uh, you know, we, we would discuss this, haven't we, Chris? But yeah, um, and the, the other thing, just very quickly to say on the ownership bit, is I just think there's, it's, this is complicated. I think we've got to be really careful how we define ownership. I think there's an individual level of ownership, which, which Dale represented incredibly well, which is about values. I don't think we assess or understand the values of people who are owning our football clubs as well as we should do. I mean, that's one of the challenges. But I think we've also got to separate out the, the, the nation states from which you know, football clubs are being bought part of the issue again with, with the, the, the Newcastle takeover and the corporations that are involved and there's three different levels of values and three different levels of why people are buying into football from, from those perspectives and I don't think we go into any of that with, with any, any, anywhere like enough rigour when, yeah. when people are, are coming into our, our game. So do you think that you know there is a, a, an element of hypocrisy amongst you know uh, um, well a lot of football fans uh, you know probably a lot of people um, including myself here who go that group of people shouldn't own it that one okay ideally not but i can accept well, it i think it's hugely yeah i mean it's, there's, a, there's a real issue for me here and, and uh, around almost a western model of what's appropriate and what's not and i'm, I'm not saying this from so, so some things are absolutely sacrosanct which is every human being is of equal value anyone involved in football any other sport that doesn't believe that shouldn't be in the sport but i do think when i look at premier league for example the number of american owners that are involved and, and the values that, that that country stands for i've got a massive issue with but yet we never talk about American ownership of football clubs, but we do talk about ownership from, from other countries. So 
I don't know how we get to making those judgments about who in, who should not be involved in football, but I think it's a really subjective perspective, which is, is, is really dangerous, I think. Mm. I think in the case of the Americans, by the way, the, the Glazers have come under the microscope, haven't they, for their for their financial model and yes, the American yeah. sort of arch capitalist yeah. approach. So I, I think there, there have been some questions. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. There oh, is a difference agree. between being a family owning a football club or an individual and a nation state. Completely. I find that quite difficult. Yeah. Um, <laughs> going back to something that we were um, discussing earlier, um, in terms of um, just the, the 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 wealth of the the Premier League, I want to um, chat to Kieran again, um, if he can get him up on the screen, because. Kieran, essentially, we can say a lot of stuff about idealistic views of, of um, how we should look at football and, and, and who should and shouldn't own clubs. But I suppose the, the reason behind why um, something like the fit and proper persons test is seen as so um, impotent, I suppose, is, is because really, from a Premier League's point of view, whether it's Richard Masters or Richard Scudamore, any chief executive of the Premier League will say, well, when I took over this job, it was earning X amount of hundreds of millions of pounds. I don't want to be the guy that loses it money or doesn't increase their revenues. I don't want to, but might make it slightly cleaner. So is that just purely from a, base, uh, a business point of view? There is an argument to say, well, look, this is all money that my job as a CEO um, of, of this huge global corporation is just to make it money and it doesn't matter where it's coming from. Um, that, that is the case. Uh, for people not familiar with the uh, structure of the Premier League, it, uh, it has 21 shareholders, of which are 20 of the clubs themselves, plus the Football Association, and the chief executive is given a remit. Now, that remit is to maximise revenues from broadcast and central commercial partners. Um, and the, the chief executive's remuneration is based on that, and bonuses are paid out of that. And in any other business, that, that would be seen as, as being the, the, the standard way forward. So it should, should we be judging uh, football through a, a different moral and ethical lens to that of of other industries, I think that is that's that's a far deeper question. And my experience of talking to to fan groups, and I, I do a lot of work with individual clubs and fan groups, is if it, if it means that we get more money and other clubs get less money, then, then we think it is a good idea. Um, but th th there's a lot of inconsistency in terms of the approach. The majority of the clubs in the Premier League are actually losing money. So if anybody puts forward the viewpoint that uh, we should be uh, dis disassociating ourselves with particular industries or particular nations, then that's likely to, to not generate a positive response from the rest of the Premier League owners. Okay, so that, 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 that kind of means that, do you think that pretty much the ship has already sailed in that regard? How can we, um, uh, as football fans who want to see perhaps a slightly purer version for want of a better phrase, um, that the, the, we can't wrestle back that? And is it going to just continue going on this trajectory of more money, more nation states, because the people who are able to buy football clubs now um, is, is kind of distilled into such either small numbers of people or pretty much nation states? Um. Ultimately, it is for the customers to decide. Now, if we were to all say, as, as a nation and other countries as well, that we are not going to watch the World Cup in November in 2022, then FIFA would have a problem because uh, FIFA is, is constantly trying to sell the next batch of TV rights. But we didn't do that in 2018 when the World Cup took place in, uh, in Russia. We're not going to do that in 2022 when the World Cup takes place in, in Qatar either. Um, so we do have the power in our hands to do that. But I, unfortunately, I, I can't see that being the case because the hype will start. It's, you know, England qualifies as soon as the draw takes place and everybody puts the, the, the dates in their diary. And, and then the, the 
to the to the television companies take a moral stance because they'll they'll be flying across all of their pundits, all of their their camera crews to Qatar. So it, it's up for people on an individual and a collective basis to to make that decision. And and there doesn't appear to be any appetite for it coming from the football fans uh, or or the or the broadcasters. They might touch, they might highlight a few stories, and it, it's it's a bit like. Uh, it's it's a bit like Men in Black, you know. As soon as the tournament starts, it's like somebody flashes a magic uh, wand in front of your eyes, and and everything that, that you previously held uh, in terms of dissatisfaction and, and and unease with the competition disappears. That's um, a really interesting point, Kieran. I don't know if this has actually ever been done. Um, certainly not while I've been here, but I, I'd be interested to know just in the room here, um, especially amongst the football fans here, who has an issue with the way that Qatar was awarded the World Cup um, and, um, a, and also kind of your, your view on, on them as a, as a country being able to host, uh, host the World Cup. If you want to raise your hands, if we can do that. Okay, I mean, it's a, it's a reasonable amount of people. Um, raise your hand if you're still going to watch the World Cup. It's, it's tough. Because as a football fan, um, you feel, and um, my colleague Zav Greenwood, who um, is on the, the on the Zoom chat today, has made this point about this. It's it's, um, it's easy to essentially be a hypocrite um, as a fan in football. Um, Flo and and Chris, I want to to come to you um, again as kind of um, your view, looking ahead to to the World Cup. Um, as fans and, and as uh, uh, as fan organisers as well, um, in yourself, Chris, on Kieran's point, what is it that that w would it take for fans to mobilise themselves properly and say enough is enough? <laughs> I think it, I, I think it's really hard because I, you know if you're talking about um, national competition, you know international competitions you have a disparate fan base anyway, right, don't you? So, and it's only, you only kind of pop up once every other year or, or whatever. Um, I don't know, I, f I found the Qatar thing quite difficult. Apart from anything else, it's like, it's always gonna be 45 degrees in Qatar in the summer. So the fact that it moved after it, the, the tournament moved after it was reward, awarded seemed odd to me, if anyone remembers that, because it was, they bid for it to be in the summer. In our summer, I should say. Mm. And then now, all, you know, all of, at least European football is going to be disrupted. Um, I think, look, I think, I think exactly what you've just said is what it comes down to. It's like, I'm deeply frustrated by it. Um, however, and from an, uh, you know, from an LGBTQ plus fan perspective, it's worrying. Um, because, you know, how safe are we going to be for the LGBTQ plus fans who want to go out there? Now, we've been given some assurances. Um, but... You do, you do wonder about that. Um, but exactly as, 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 as Kieran said there, it's like, are we going to switch off? Because that's the thing that will have attention paid to it, is whether you're going to switch off. And, you know, if those advertising pounds aren't going to be you know, sort of maximised in the right way because there won't be eyeballs there. Um, I probably won't watch as much of it. Whether I will watch England, probably. Um, I'm not a huge England fan, though, actually. I think it's interesting. If I look back to, if you look back to, like, Euro 96, maybe it's my age, to be honest. Um, you know, the excitement I felt around England in Euro 96. I mean, I lived in Birmingham at the time. And actually, um, Holland, the, the, the Holland were based in, in, in Birmingham. We had a great time with the Dutch fans, actually. Um, and the excitement I felt about England there and about really, you know, getting behind players that I wouldn't have, you know, like being excited about David Seaman, for example, which I couldn't imagine now <laughs> as a Spurs fan. Um, I don't feel the same way about the English national team now. Um, maybe that's because we've become so entrenched from a Premier League perspective in our football clubs. Um, so I, I, I do wonder about that, but I don't know. It's like, you also hear stories about people, people want to go to Qatar. Is there anywhere to stay? No, not really. It's a yeah. tiny, it's a tiny, no, tiny no, country. Qatar's was a luxury hotel. I know, but can you afford it? But they're, yeah, all, they're, they're not expensive. There's, no, there's very few accommodation, mm. even though they, yeah. you know, if you read any of the, the re reports that Human Rights Watch have 
delivered, you know, detailing how many how many people have died as a result yeah. of it or the way they've been treated. Uh, uh, a number of times, and um, they're building stadiums that we've never seen before. I mean, talk about the heat; they'll be air conditioned. <coughs> um, <coughs> they hosted. I went to see Liverpool play in the World Club Championship a couple of years ago. And, um, At what this cost, though, have they built those stadiums? Well, so yeah, there's, there's, human there's, cost. There's, there's an issue. I, I, yeah. I don't doubt that at all. Um, you know, we've seen that in other countries as well. I mean, I, I, I don't doubt there's an issue. There's no, that is that is concerning, definitely. But you're just talking about hotel accommodation, I think. And uh, they will have plenty of accommodation. It's very high standards. You, know, you forget, it's the richest country in the world per capita. And, you know, they know how to, to, how to deliver. I mean, I've stayed in a number of the hotels, and they're not expensive. They're not prohibitively expensive. Um, so, that, so, no, just in terms of accommodation. What about numbers, though? Because, yeah. as I, I mean, I, listen, I don't know much about this, but I did have a look, and Qatar is half the size of Wales. Yeah, it's, it's a small well, what I've heard from a fan point of view, yeah. I've, when I've spoken yeah. to fans who are actively trying to go there, they've said to me, we cannot find anywhere to stay for love nor money. Yeah. And that's why the Qatari government are trying to persuade locals to start a scheme where they'll open up. Mm. their houses and their flats or whatever and say you fans can come and stay with us which could be a brilliant thing that actually sparks the world cup as in a really positive way to say actually there's lots of people who experience local culture got to meet local people but from from any other point of view i think they are quite panicked about the lack of accommodation that does make you worry i mean the b bigger picture though um, with without getting too stuck on logistics as much as i love talking about logistics and flights and trains and things like that. I think I think there's two, there's, well, firstly, I'd also like to say this summer, the Women's Euros is going to be in England. So if you want to feel, not, it's not sunshine and rain rainbows, don't get me yeah. wrong, but if you want a different bit more of a, a, a bit different yeah. more of football joy and a p more positive experience and people not shoving flares up their bum, I would recommend experiencing <laughs> that. But w what I think makes me, do, makes me feel a bit more hopeful is looking at what happened when clubs tried to create the Super League. And it was the first sign for me of a bit of fan power. Um, you know, the way that those billionaire men came out and were so embarrassed with their heads low, like, like naughty school children that have just been told off by their headmaster for doing something wrong and had to say, oh, we're so sorry. And the way that fans came together to, to stand up and take notice and, you know, you had people like P Peter Cech coming out of Stamford Bridge trying to negotiate and say, you know, this is nothing to do with me, I'm so sorry. You know, I don't, you don't want to see those scenes, but I do think it showed that there is still a little bit of fan power here. And I think people needed an injection of that to feel like they mattered because if you, I think if you ask most football fans, do you feel like you matter? They would probably say no. Mm. But I think the Super League failed experiment, which has by no means gone away, I think it did show that it'll probably come about and they'll try to do it differently and it might succeed. <coughs> but in that moment, what they were trying to do wasn't going to happen. And a large part of that was because fans stood up and said, we're not going to, we're not going to accept this. Yeah. yeah. On that and talk about the Premier League earlier. The ESL was the logical extension of the way football finance has gone over the years. You know, the, 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 the Premier League was set up really as an elite separate from the championship with all the financial difficulties that that introduced. And the ESL was just the next step. It was here you had, you know, Europe's big 12, which still includes Tottenham, amazingly, um, and Arsenal. Um, but, you know, the big 12, <laughs> it's easy, oh, it's easy. they're very big clubs. But, you know, the big, the so-called big 12, we're going to play each other every season with no relegation, no promotion. So I think what really stuck in the fans' craw was, wait a minute, you know, we've got, the, the, our clubs are based in communities. We love the idea that you can have a Leicester City that you can have sides doing stuff from, from next to nothing, that you know, a forest green can, can be set up and, and work its way to the top of, of, of League Two. Fans love that because it's their communities. So I think that, that was very heartwarming, that reaction. And, what was, and it was so ill thought out. I mean, did they really not think that this was going to happen, that fans would just sort of accept the European Super League? It was an extraordinary miscalculation, but I'm glad it was. And it did show how much fans care about their clubs' relationship with their communities and about the chance to get better. Mm. You know, that there's still a chance in the FA Cup for a smaller side to win. And the Premier League has, you know, it's become more difficult. Yeah. And it would have been impossible with the ESL. The We've still got issues with the Premier League, but at least we didn't take that step. 
I, I agree with Flo personally that I don't think that idea has, has gone away yet because I think it is the logical next step um, and that will be a discussion for another time. I think the specter of it still looms large. The, the, the website europeansuperleague.com is still live if you want to go on it, um, incredibly. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't think it has gone away. Um, we are reaching the, um, this is the first time we've had our beautiful um, timeline on the screen. So I'm kind of, it, it does loom heavy over uh, over my head and it's, uh, you can reach, you see it reaching the end. Um, but um, before we before we finish, Tony, I just want to come to you um, uh, finally uh, in terms of, from a journalistic point of view for, for us, where do you see kind of the next stories coming out? From, from what you see in a, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, being, mo like being seen and hearing from fans on a, on a daily basis, where, do we, where should we be looking out for um, the next kind of set of stories that we could be pursuing? <laughs> and what do you think matters most as well? We just had a conversation before, and then we saw, I'm probably not alluding to that. I think, I think there's, there's, there's a couple of things here, again, which w one is what's going to be coming out, and the, I guess the second question, probably the more important question for me, is where should you be focusing your attention as journalists? So I get sick of being asked a question about taking the knee. Uh, it's been asked a million times over the last 18 months. No one's ever asked me about structural racism in the UK, what that looks like, how it impacts football. How can we tackle structural racism? How do, we, how do we take it down? But everybody, I mean, two weeks ago, the Millwall played Crystal Palace. Even before the Millwall Crystal Palace game happened, we had journalists phoning us saying, what do you think about Millwall fans got potentially booing taking the knee? I said, I couldn't give a monkey's. That argument's been won. Do you want to talk about racism in football? Let's talk about how many black or Asian coaches are in the dugouts for the FA Cup third round. That's a really pertinent question that nobody wanted to ask. Let's talk about how many black, Asian or female referees are refereeing the games in the third round of the FA Cup. So for me, I think journalists have a responsibility to start setting an agenda that tackles the real issues and not following some of the populist nonsense that's around. And, and, a, and a big agenda that I think has been ignored, particularly in football, and Chris was part of a fantastic debate on Football Focus uh, last weekend, is, is, is women in football. Not just in terms of women's Super League, but women's participation as fans in the game and what women experience in the game. Uh, and it's, again, it's pertinent now, but that's the kind of stuff that we should be talking about. Not who's taking the knee and not some of the other rubbish that we kind of, we constantly obsess around. Mm. Okay. Um, the, the the little flag I've been told um, by our super tech staff means that there's five minutes to go, rather than it being a finishing flag, um, which will be you know, an interesting design point of view that we'll probably that we'll probably flag uh, uh, tomorrow in a meeting. Um, but but, um, but it does mean that I, I want to um, finally turn to my colleague Dave Taylor. If we can get a, a, a microphone over to Dave, um, because Dave is incredibly learned. Anne is a Newcastle <laughs> fan, um, and I kind of wanted. Uh, <laughs> no, they're not. And and I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of what you've heard this evening, um, especially with regard to trying to answer our question: um, Is is ugly money good for good for football? We've heard a hell of a lot uh, across a lot yeah. of different I things tonight. It de doesn't it depend on on it? If, if you, your starting point was, you know, that football's never been more attractive as a product, you know, that as a sport, it's thrilling and all of that, and it's got all these fans around the world. So you could make the case that wherever the money comes from, it makes for the spectacle. So if you're, if you're watching the Premier League or the Champions League from somewhere outside of Europe, you could make the case that it is thrilling. And, and actually, you do only want to see Real Madrid play Liverpool, you don't really care about Leicester. Um, and I've certainly, when I was living in the States, um, was aware of fans who only really cared about Champions League football and it was at the top level and they would, they would have totally bought into that. Um, but I think if you, if you start from a club perspective and a fan of a club in a community, then I think it's, it's hideous for, for football and I feel ashamed of the Saudi takeover at Newcastle and I don't really know what to do about it, if I'm honest, as a, as a fan. I mean, I'm still going to matches. I'm still a season ticket holder. Um, there was actually uh, perhaps the brightest spot since they took over, I think, was there was an LGBTQ plus banner in the Gallagher end for one match. And I thought at least that is a gesture. It's a poke in the eye of the Saudi owners. But I, I, I'm sort of looking around for the good example of the progressive fan base um, and I'm guessing it might be somewhere in the middle of the Bundesliga I don't know but um, I, I, I feel 
mortified in a way that, um, you know, throughout all of the Ashley era when, when everyone wanted to push past him because he, he, he didn't care about ambition, didn't want to push the club forward as a sporting entity. People spoke about, um, you know, the importance of Newcastle as a representation of all that was best in our community. And we pushed that argument all the time until somebody came along and kicked him out the door, you know, and they didn't, it felt like most fans didn't care about where the money came from. They only wanted to compete. I think all fans want their clubs to compete, but I think in, in reality, um, I would probably rather we were um, halfway up the championship and, and winning every week and, and it was good fun with your mates rather than, um, you know, threatening the, the Champions League through all of the excesses of the Saudis. And, and so I, I'm left wondering, you know, we talked about the Newcastle manager going to, you know, warm weather training in Saudi Arabia and saying football is my only focus. I think like that has worn so thin <coughs> already. You can't be that guy. I think if you're a, a fan or a player or an official, you have to actually stand for something more than just loyalty to your club. And you have to think about, you know, regardless of whether there is a, a, a difficult relationship with any brand in any walk of life, you have to actually say, this club represents us and it should repre represent the best of us and we should challenge the views of the owners, this autonomous commercial entity that now supposedly owns our club. I hate it. I think the, the, I think <coughs> the problem with football, and I think that's why this is why it's so unique, we do see it in other areas of society. I mean, think about the report that came out about you know the Met Police today, but I think what football has done is it's blurred its moral compass so much that you have no sense of right and wrong anymore. And we, you know, for decades now, I mean, think, uh, you, you spoke about how Newcastle was, you know, their heritage and, and their community was so important to them. And I think about Luis Suarez and Liverpool, a club which is so, you know, passionate and so proud of its heritage, its community, its diversity, its working class roots, and yet someone who was charged with racism, admitted to being racist towards another player, was still a hero for that club, still stayed at that club, you know, we're still part of that club, and I feel like the, the moral compass just doesn't exist in football anymore, and, and I don't see how you can, you can find it again, ever. I mean, I feel like, you know, you do see little pockets like the Super League or, or clubs like Clapton in, in, in non-league or, or Peckham FC or lots of other small clubs that are doing so, mu so much great community work, and then you say to them, you know, how do you go beyond that? And they don't know because ev everything is just... Shit now. <laughs> 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 uh, what a thing, no, go on, Dave. Okay, we, 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 yeah. well, the, the flag's still flying. So. Why, why, why we get so caught up in it is because it's a fantastic sport. It's amazing entertainment. And we know that the World Cup, as in Russia, as in all World Cups, there'll be great goals. There'll be dreams will be made. There'll be, there'll be the, the, the mythology of football will, be, will go on, will take giant strides, as it does in every major tournament. There'll be games we'll be talking about. There'll be goals we'll be talking about. And this is part of the problem, that, that that's, what, that's what people get caught up in. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. But, and so I think we're almost, it's almost as if we're all sort of destined to be hypocritical about football. Because, you know, it, it's something that we love, it's something that, that excites and, and moves people almost more, more than most things. And yet we know there are these, all these issues, you know, whether it be race, whether it be the women in football, LGBT, all these issues we know and we're aware and we discuss them very well here. But you think, does that all get just sort of pushed aside as we get caught up in our desire for teams to give exciting football? And let's face it, for our teams to win. I'm going to just very quickly, oh just to, yeah. to, to, to a little bit to Flo's point, because I, yeah. I sort of agree with her. But then I think <laughs> about all of the brilliant work that a lot of um, Premier League football clubs do in their communities. So, you know, the Tottenham Hotspur Foundation does brilliant work in Harringay and Enfield. The Arsenal Foundation does really good work in Islington QPR and, in, in and QPR in Hammersmith yeah. Fulham. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, across the country. And so, you know, could you, you could argue, as I'm just like going to convince myself out of this now, but I was just thinking, <laughs> you could argue it's like the equivalent of, it's the equivalent of, um, 
of the, the you know, of the Saudis buying sport Newcastle. Oh, yes, like another sort of thing, another way of sport washing. However, that work is, is really, it's really, imp it's really important and it makes a massive difference to loads and loads of people's lives. And it matters because of that is football, because it's football, because a lot, you know, I know the Tottenham Hotspur Foundation, for example, does a lot of work with um, young people. And it's, and it's football that's going to hook in those young people, right? And actually, you know, working with other organisations that are going to do sort of charitable work with them, it's not going to, it won't work. So there is something there that I it think... Still has, it still has purpose. Yeah, there is, still, there is still purpose. And I think, and I don't think, you know, like I'm an optimist actually as well. I think that's the other thing is, you know, I hear Flo say, are we ever going to find that compass? And I'm like, yes, Flo, of course we are. Well, somehow we will. Because we have to believe that. Because if we don't believe that, then we don't, we're not able to go out and try and make change. Because, you know, if we're so battened down to think, oh, we can't do anything, then we can't. And if we felt we were so battened down that we can't do anything, we wouldn't have opposed the ESL and we wouldn't have done half of the things that we, you know, as Tony said, there are more than, there are 60 LGBTQ plus fan groups. When I started, there were four, including us, you know? And, and we've made a change. We've made a change in our football clubs and in our fan bases. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, and thank you to, to, to everyone. Um, we have massively run over time, so I a massive, a huge, a huge apologies. It's um, you know if you go to any football match and um, any any kind of uh, fourth official holds up a board that says eight on it, you go, hey, where's that come from? Um, but we've got eight minutes over time. Um, apologies for going into additional time, but thank you to to for Flo, to Chris, to David, um, to Tony, to Kieran um, and Dale. I think your kickoff is literally in six minutes time so you need to get out of there um, and thank you to, to everyone um, uh, I suppose kind of modern life might make hypocrites of us all but perhaps the the, um, the, the it is too compelling the, the entertainment that goes behind football and the money that goes with it perhaps is is too compelling but um, there's something that I suppose especially in this coming year um, we will all have to wrestle with on, on a personal um, basis as well so thank you to everyone for coming apologies it's gone over slightly um, but it's our first one back we're a little bit rusty but thank you <laughs>